Shabbat Shalom. Maybe you didn't know this, but in my house, my children treat me like a god. That's right, they treat me like a god. You know, they only talk to me when they need a favor. Of course, I'm just kidding. But as we continue to discuss the future of conservative Judaism, to consider what it means to belong to the Jewish people or to behave as a Jew, we must first and foremost look to the very premise of Judaism itself, faith in the one God. There is no Judaism without belief in God. It is profoundly true that we come to our faith in different ways, at different times, and with different understandings. But at the heart of Judaism, and therefore at the heart of conservative Judaism, is faith in the one whose full description defies the limits of human language and whose infinite existence surpasses the finitude of human cognition. Of course, while we cannot fully describe God nor fully understand God, we affirm the existence of God, and we assert that thousands of years ago, God established with the Jewish people a covenant, a contract, that enables us to maintain expectations of God, that informs us that God has expectations of us, and that through this relationship with God and the Jewish people, we can, in partnership, bring meaning and joy to the individual, peace and justice to humankind. Our Torah teaches that God created humanity, part animal and part divine. Our bodies are very much animal. We need food, water, and shelter. But unlike animals, humanity has long attributed access to food, water, and shelter to the partnership between God and humankind. Like other species of animal, we've learned that we maximize our potential to acquire these basic elements of life by partnering with others of, our, of the same species in a shared quest. But unlike animals, we are endowed with a higher level of being. Some might call it cognition, and others like me would call it our soul. It is this higher level of being to which we turn after either satiating our need or exhausting our efforts for food, water, and shelter. In those moments of quiet or of desperation, humanity transcends the rest of the animal kingdom by asking four questions. One, what happens after we die? Two, hoping that something happens after we die, how do we prepare ourselves to maximize that afterlife experience? Three, how do we live today a life of meaning and joy? And four, how do we place limits on individuals' meaning and joy to maximize the collective experience of meaning and joy? That is to say, in what ways can we comprehend the seeming injustice in the world around us? And how do we reconcile that injustice? Most of all though, most of all, we just want to be told that everything will be okay. That whatever service we are experiencing will come to an end and that we are not alone. Judaism is one family's attempt to answer these four questions by engaging in conversation with the singular creator who we believe uniquely knows the answers to these questions. It is our faith and the subsequent answers we perceive to these great questions that bring us from conversation with the deity to relationship with the divine. Moreover, these answers that we surmise to life's great questions, our beliefs, guide our definitions of Jewish belonging and Jewish behaving. It is from our faith that all aspects of Jews and Judaism flow and follow. We believe that the soul defies death, that the soul is eternal, especially when we practice righteousness in this world. We believe that our rituals give us meaning and joy, and we believe that our task is to pursue justice. Moreover, we believe that God has a plan for all creation, that this plan is just, and that we are always on a path toward redemption. Most of all, we believe that with God, we are never alone. And as shared believers and family, we are never alone. We believe that with God, there is always hope too. And so long as we work together as shared believers and family, we can perpetuate and spread that hope. We believe too that in exchange for our service to our heavenly parent, 
we receive the blessings of love, land, and lineage. Judaism, then, is the process by which our family, our community, our people strive to achieve as individuals a place in heaven and as a collective to earn those blessings of love, land, and lineage. Judaism is also a roadmap to live with meaning and joy and in partnership with God to bring justice to a world so full of injustice. The old joke asks, why did it take Moses 40 years to lead the Israelites out of the wilderness? The answer, being a typical man, Moses refused to stop and ask for directions. Jewish memory, however, tells us something very different. Moses possessed something better than a map. The prophet simply followed his GPS. Yes, his God positioning service which told Moses exactly what route to take to reach the promised land. Moses accepted that being in relationship with the divine means subsuming some of our desires or our understanding of the world to recognize that God holds the big picture and therefore we should follow God's path. At the same time, the Exodus is a central narrative of our people notwithstanding. The reality of history demonstrates that in every generation, we Jews continually strive through fog to understand God, to deepen our relationship with God, and to fulfill God's expectations of us. Traditionally, God's mystery and perceived distancing from us are explained through the notion of Hester Panim, that is, God is hiding from humanity, in ongoing punishment for our misdeeds and the pervasive injustice in the world. However, as conservative Jews, we, unlike our Orthodox brothers and sisters, might also suggest that our lack of clarity regarding God's expectations of us results from the human origins of sacred scripture. The academic study of Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, leads us to understand the Tanakh as an expression of our ancestors' very human and fallible perception of God's demands from us. This scientific historical approach to sacred scripture grants us a certain flexibility with regard to our interpretation and application of Jewish law. In so doing, conservative Jews desire to follow Jewish law, while at the same time preferring a lenient precedent to a stricter one. Conservative Judaism asks that we veer from tradition, though, only when change is needed. Additionally, conservative Judaism asks us to sacrifice some personal pleasure and comfort for the sake of community, and for the intention of being in relationship with God, while still providing a Judaism that speaks to us as 21st century Jews. Also, conservative Judaism places significant emphasis on the moral component of interpreting Jewish law, placing human dignity at the forefront of our Jewish legal process. Additionally, conservative Jews emphasize a halachic pluralism that honors different communities have different needs and different people need different avenues to connect with each other and with our creator. What unifies us as a conservative movement though is not our practice, but our process of decision-making which affirms our desire to conserve Jewish ritual, to perform acts of loving kindness and to pursue justice. On the other hand, conservative Judaism separates itself from our reform brothers and sisters by this adherence to a halachic or Jewish legal process. Conservative Judaism offers us meaning and purpose by combining a contemporary understanding of history and science with the deep moral insight and profound life wisdom of our sages. I believe in many ways that it is a committed conservative Jew's role to seek meaning and tradition. But when that meaning still does not come after concerted effort, to ask his or her rabbi for change. It is then the rabbi's job to consider this change while taking into account the perspectives of our great grandparents who bequeathed their Judaism to us alongside the perceived needs of our great grandchildren to whom we hope to bequeath our Judaism. It is a product of these conversations that 70 years ago gave us permission for a Jew to drive, but only to the synagogue, and today gives us permission for us to participate in our services on the computer while not jumping from Ain Kalohenu to shopping on Amazon. As conservative Jews, we seek in our time to participate in the same covenant as our ancestors, 
while declaring that the covenant is not so much a fixed contract as it is an ongoing conversation, a process of two committed actors in the process of halakha, the act of walking together with each other. Finally, as conservative Jews building a future for conservative Judaism, we must wrestle with the fact that the worst tragedy for the Jews and the greatest blessing to happen to the Jewish people occurred nearly simultaneously less than a century ago. How do we understand God and God's role in our lives in light of the Holocaust and the birth of the state of Israel? What today does God demand of us and what in turn are we asking of God? These are the questions we must explore with each other as after reaffirming our faith in God and in God's covenant with the Jewish people, we seek to behave as conservative Jews and to belong to a conservative Jewish community. In the ancient Midrash, Rabbi Chi of our Abba teaches that God appears to each of us in a way appropriate for each time and in each experience. At the Red Sea, Rabbi Chi explains, God appeared to us as a mighty warrior. At Sinai, God appeared to us as a veteran teacher. In the days of Daniel, God appeared to us as an elder sage. And in the days of Solomon, God appeared to us as a young lover, full of energy and passion. How we perceive God on Yom Kippur is different than how we perceive God in moments of sorrow or fear. How we perceive God in the pre-industrial age differs from how we perceive God in a technology age. The future of conservative Judaism must help us to perceive God in our times and for our times. And in so doing, must help us to understand what God wants of us and to express and seek that which we demand of God. Friends, as we journey together into the future of conservative Judaism, I pray that we should seek to open ourselves to the God who comforts and also who commands, to the God who embraces but also who expects us to practice pious self-discipline with the goal of personal growth and communal strength. Then, what matters is not whether we experience God as a heavenly parent or a divine shepherd, as a powerful ruler or as a forever spouse, as a mighty warrior or veteran teacher or as an elder sage or youthful partner. What matters is that we seek a God encounter, not just when we want something from God, but also when God wants something from us. In so doing, may we find humility, may we find gratitude, may we find purpose, and may we find comfort in the belief that truly, truly everything will be okay and that we are not alone. May we find comfort in the belief that truly, truly everything will be okay and that we, we, are not alone. Kei Nihi Ratzon, may this be God's will, may this be our will, and let us say together, Amen.